Okay, great. I guess we'll start. Um, so Phil will uh, start the second session uh, talking about how we've evaluated uh, low input RNA sequencing. Hi everyone, um, my name's Phil Yules and I work up in NGI applications as a bioinformatician and um, it's our job to kind of take uh, new techniques and uh, refine existing techniques to try and push them into the main production part of our, of our facility. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at recently is something that a lot of people are interested in, which has been mentioned already, which is low, low, low amounts of RNA uh, coming into our RNA sequencing pipeline. So this is a really short presentation, just a quick uh, run through of kind of a kind of quality control checks that we do and how we decide on the, the requirements that we set for you guys. So at the moment, if you want to run an RNA-seq library, these are the kind of requirements that we'll, we'll ask you for. Um, we want nice high quality RNA with a high high RIN value, which was described earlier, so RIN value of, of greater than 8. Um, a certain concentration, certain volumes, but, but importantly, we ask for a lot of RNA at the moment, uh, greater than or equal to 2 micrograms of RNA. Um, and that is, that's, a, that's a lot of RNA, and that can equate to a lot of, a lot of cells. Um, depending on your experimental setup, this, of course, might not be possible. If you're using, with, if you're using experimental setups where you're using primary tissue samples or something like that, a rare, rare cell type, you might not have this much RNA available to you, and that can be problematic. So we set out to find kind of exactly what difference using... Um, a limited amount of input RNA makes to the, the final library that's produced. So the reason we ask for these input requirements, as again, as touched upon, is that we, we really try to provide good quality libraries for everybody. So we set our, our bar pretty high. Um, and as Matthias described, we, we actually guarantee um, the library's success for you and, and we'll, we'll, we'll try again and refund you or not charge you if, if it doesn't work. So we, we really want to make sure that what we ask you for will be enough. But RNA-seq protocols have improved recently. Um, and we have actually taken a number of samples from people below the 2 microgram limit um, uh, on the basis that we don't guarantee the results. So basically, the risk falls on, on your shoulders if you come to us with less than 2 micrograms. But those libraries seem to have been working, and, and they seem to have been doing well. So in order to change the requirements that we ask everybody, we need to test and we need to validate these things because we're, we're accredited. So we need to be absolutely sure and we need to be able to show why we choose the requirements that we ask you for. And so we set out to find out exactly, quantify how much difference using low inputs of RNA makes. So the setup we did was, was quite simple. We took two different samples of RNA. The top one is from Life Technologies, so that, that, that's just RNA that they deliver to us in the tube already prepared. So it should be very, very pure, comes from HeLa cells. Um, and also we grew up the cell line, GM12878 cell line ourselves in-house and prepped that RNA ourselves. Uh, and we came up with these different samples which we ran. I've highlighted the RIN scores for the bottom three samples because these library preps actually didn't go very well, <laughs> which was quite a nice thing to test. So, so these samples would have failed our QC checks because they've got the RIN values less than eight. But we ran them anyway because we wanted to see what, what would happen, what it would look like. And you can see that we started all of these samples are less than 2 micrograms, but we started off with 1,000 nanograms, 1 microgram, and went down to 50. And these are the read pairs that came back at the end, and you can see they're all sequenced to pretty similar read depths. So they're, in terms of the libraries that are produced, the sequences are produced, they're pretty comparable. The only difference really is the RIN scores and the starting amount of material. So something we look at for... A lot of different libraries we produce is uh, library complexity. And some of you, if you've had library sequence here, you might have seen this plot before. Um, I'll take you through it. Basically, what we have on the two axes are the total number of molecules sequenced and the number of unique non-duplicated molecules observed. And the dotted line there uh, is a one-to-one -one ratio. So if any, something falls on that line, then everything that's sequenced is unique. And what we do is we, we subsample the, the sample, so we take different amounts of reads up to the total amount seen, uh, extrapolate that, and we can we can work out whether the library is being saturated. At a certain point, if you keep sequencing the library deep enough, then you'll just start seeing the same reads again and again, and you'll just be having less and less unique molecules for the more sequences you read in. So the angle of a slope tells us how complex the library is. 
And what you can see from this is that, sure enough, the lines get shallower and shallower as we lower the input amount of material. But the bottom three samples, which are the GM, the in-house cell line, those are all fall below the high quality RNA. So you can see that the RIN score is having a, a greater effect on the library complexity than the input material. So that's kind of an interesting first opinion. But just talking about unique molecules and, and is, is not biologically necessarily that intuitive. So we, I tested this in terms of number of genes observed as well. So here it's basically the same plot, but now we're looking at the number of genes we see with a FPKM of greater than one. So this is normalized for recount and everything. And again, subsampled along the x-axis. And you, again, you can see that the RIN value is having a stronger effect on how many genes we see than the, the, the amount of input material. And also that uh, these, these profiles are all pretty much falling on top of each other. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. Uh, a key metric we looked at is how well the samples cluster. If we're taking samples which are 200 nanograms, we want to make sure that they produce libraries which are very, very similar to how they'd look if we were taking two micrograms. So we cluster the samples together. You can see that they go by sample, which is always reassuring. Uh, but, and you can see that uh, basically all the samples are clustering together, apart from the 50 nanogram samples, which are starting to step out just a fraction here, um, which is kind of maybe a warning sign that 50 nanograms is, is starting to reach the threshold of, of, of what makes a difference. We can do this on a more specific basis, where if we actually look at scatter plots, this is a pretty complex plot that's just showing scatter plots of every sample against every other for the ambient RNA. Uh, but what's quite interesting to me here is these two histograms, um, which show FPKM along the x-axis, so how highly observed a transcript is, and the frequency of the different transcripts at each level. And you can see for 200 nanograms, you get this new classic uh, two-peak setup, and for 50 nanograms, we're seeing, starting to see a decrease in the number of genes with lowly expressed FPKM counts. So as we lower the complexity of the libraries, the poorly expressed transcripts are starting to fall off the bottom of our detection limit. And in fact, if you look at all these scatter plots, you can see that all of the scatter plots against the, the bottom right one here, the, F, the 50 nanogram ones, look a bit skewed, a bit biased, whereas all the others are very similar to each other. And so what this shows us is that as we come down to 200 nanograms, we say, see very little difference, but as we go from 200 to 50 nanogram input, we're starting to see an effect on the, the sequencing results that we get back from the library. Okay, I told you it was short. Uh, <laughs> just to wrap up, basically uh, what this validation has shown us is that um, going down to 200 nanograms of input RNA it seems to make relatively little difference to the final results in our hands. Um, but going below 200 nanograms, it starts to become slightly more, uh, more fishy for these samples. Um, it shows us something we already knew, which is that the quality of the input RNA, the RIN values, uh, is more important than the, the, the amount of starting material. Um, and based on, on this validation, we will shortly be lowering our input requirements for RNA samples down to greater than or equal to 200 nanograms rather than 2 micrograms, which is obviously a uh, big difference. So hopefully that will... That will help everyone submitting samples um, to get to NGI. Um, if you want to read more about this, we're going to be releasing a tech note describing basically the same slides I've just shown you pretty shortly, so that will be available on, on the portal website. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take <laughs> Oh, sorry, I meant to say that. Um, Trucy Collier stranded. Yeah, sure, absolutely. If we'd used the ribose area, we would have seen less of a drop off as a result of the winds, for sure. But still, I mean, the, the, the ambient RNA was basically perfect quality RNA. It had a wind score of 10, so the effect, we saw the 50 nanogram effect within that sample as well. <laughs>